and I'm very happy to see so many old friends sitting here in the audience. And I'm also very happy to see some new friends who they will find in due course were really my old friends. I did not come here late. I was hiding outside. <laughs> so they could fix the tape recorder. It did occur to me for a few minutes, why are they fixing this tape recorder when they have a live tape recorder like me? In a way, I am no more than a tape recorder. What I speak before you is a recording. It's a recording done earlier. Maybe the voice may sound different, but the recording was done by this man, whose picture you see here, the great master. Everything I speak, anywhere I go, is a tape-recorded version of what great master said and did. In a sense, we are all tape recorders. If we can look at our lives, we feel we have a control over things. We feel we can make decisions and do things. In retrospect, looking back on our life, we find we were helpless. Things just moved on relentlessly, as if there was a tape made of what was to happen. That life itself was just a tape playing out. That destiny is a very strong thing. That we are either the victims of the destiny, if we don't like it, or the architects of that destiny, if we like it. But destiny seems to play a very important role. What is destiny? Do we make it? Or has somebody else handed it down to us? When we look at our capacity to make decisions, it looks like we make our own destiny. When we reach the crossroads every day and do not know which side to turn, right or left, it appears to us we have a choice. We can turn right or left. The choice is so obvious, the options are so obvious, that when we find we have to make a choice, we think we make our own destiny. Once we have made our choice, in a few days, we find that we would have made some other choice if we really had free will. That we seem to make choices which are predestined. It's a very funny situation. That we go along our, on the way of our life and we seem to be making decisions which look in retrospect to have been made in advance. And what would happen if, as it happened in the case of a few people that I know of, we could suddenly open the page of our book of destiny of a week later from today and see what decision we have made that day. See it clearly and then come back to today and keep on making decisions and when that day comes we find we make precisely the decision we saw a week earlier. How do we account for this? How can people have dreams in which they can prophesy? what will happen next week. If decisions are being, as, being made as we go along, how can we know anything about the future? How much control do we have? It appears that this feeling of control, this feeling that we make our own destiny, is responsible both for our good and happiness and also responsible for our misery. If we had no feeling, of making our own life and our own destiny, we would think we just got a package to live through. It was a ride like Disney World. You sit on that little train, it takes you around. Whatever it has to show you, it shows you, you're out. And life would be like that, like a Disney World ride. You would have no choice. You would enjoy it or you would scream if it is horrible, depending on your age, <laughs> mental age. But in any case, you would not feel the pangs of guilt. You would not feel you've done anything immoral. If you sit on a Disney World tram that goes around those various rides, things happen there. You see the pirates raiding, and you see Cinderella, and you see all kinds of other characters come up and do various things. There is no feeling of guilt. What they are doing, they are doing. It's the right. You have no choice. But when you feel you are doing it, and you are doing something wrong, 
you feel so terribly guilty about it. You've done something wrong and make life miserable for yourself. Does it mean that just because we feel we make our destiny, we have created a whole set of moral laws? Is morality merely a side issue to the fact we feel we make our decisions? Looks very funny that just by an illusion of free will, an illusion that we make our life, that nobody else can do anything, and yet the life that we make, we would never make if we really had free will. It's too terrible to make. We make such terrible destiny for ourselves. How could we be making it? If we had the choice, we would make something great. We feel guilty. We have made mistakes. We are in error. And therefore, we have to punish ourselves. This whole system of punishing ourselves comes from our own feeling of free will. Have you ever uh, pondered over this? That by an illusion of this feeling of free will that we are making it, we set up a nice pattern of rewarding and punishing ourselves. This has penetrated deeply into our lives. In the East, we call this self-inflicted system of punishment and reward as the law of karma. The law of karma is nothing more than going through a feeling of being rewarded for the good we have done and for the and the feeling of being punished for the bad we have done and this feeling of doing good or doing bad is based upon the feeling we make our own decisions it creates another very serious problem if we make our own decisions and our own destiny what role does god play if we believe too much in morality and if we believe too much in the fact that we have our free will to make our decisions, we denigrate the position of the ultimate creator who we want to feel is running the whole show. If the, if the creator and God is running the whole show and we are making decisions, what is he doing? In fact, the more we think we make our decisions, the more the tendency comes in us to be an atheist. We don't want to say it. We grown up in the church. We grown up in the temple. We have grown up to believe there is a God. But God is good. And we are making mistakes. Therefore, we must be punished. And God must be hiding somewhere. Helpless. Instead of knowing the truth that we are helpless, it's God's show going on in every way. And therefore, having the capacity to live in the will of God, we turn it all around, put God aside, and say, we make our destiny, we run our lives, and God can do nothing and make him helpless. See how we have twisted this? The implications are far, far-reaching implications of this. Implications are, it becomes difficult to have faith in God. How can you have faith in God if you are doing what God's job? It was God's job to create our life and to give us what we have. We thank him for every breath we have. We thank him for every moment of life we have. And yet we say, God, you gave us the time to have breathing and time to have moments of life, but now we are messing it up ourselves, so we have to be punished. If you go back into the real cause of human suffering, you will find that the real cause of human suffering is the fact we have inflicted upon ourselves the guilt of our own decision making. Therefore, we are missing out on a great reality around us, the reality of a single creator, the reality of a single creator who is in full control and has never left that control, the reality of a God who is full of love, the reality of a God who doesn't care what kind of mistakes we make or don't make. He loves us all the time because he we are our children, we are his children, we are a cre creature of the same essence of consciousness, which in totality is called God. That we represent the same thing in terms of awareness, in terms of consciousness. We are of the same substance as the total creator. And yet in this beautiful situation where we could live in peace with the love of God and live in his will, we have turned it topsy-turvy and taken upon ourselves 
No, we must make correct decisions. We have to be right and wrong. You go to hell for this. You go to heaven for this. We'll go to hell for this and we'll go to heaven for this. And we have totally messed up our lives. Think of it in this way. Supposing our belief system became stronger than our system of illusion of free will. And we believed that there is a God. And we believe that God does everything. And we believe that we have the capacity to choose to live in the will of God. That we would constantly, every day, every moment, do only what God instructs. Supposing we designed our whole life and we find that God is constantly shining through us. He's constantly working through us. He's constantly giving us opportunities of all kinds. And we are enjoying and doing exactly what he wants. And we are having a ride in the grand Disney world he set up for us called life. And won't we fall in love with such a God? We will be instantly in love with such a God. And there will be no question of guilt. By saying guilt, you are saying God is making mistakes. We would have so much happiness inside us. We would be filled up by the grace of God, by the love of God, and by love for each other. We would look at each other and we would see God in everything. Which is the truth. The amazing thing is that what I am saying, I am requesting you to suppose this is so. The truth is, if you go within yourself and find the truth for yourself, you will find what I am saying is what you will find. That God indeed is the only reality. The rest is illusion. There's only a single reality, and that's a totality of consciousness. That consciousness is never split. It's always one. It has never been divided. And that's called God, the creator. And he, or I call it he just for, for sake of tradition, otherwise there's no he or she there. <laughs> and it will be, I don't think it's appropriate to call God it. <laughs> but let's say God is the only reality, and the only reality is operating through our consciousness and makes us feel that we have been individuated in order to play a role. Let us uh, assume that God is the only reality. Let's accept it, because we read about it, we speak about it, we believe it. If God is the only reality, that means God alone exists. What would happen to such a God? I don't know about happiness or unhappiness. I can tell you there would certainly be loneliness. How can a single real entity, a single real being, a single real consciousness with no other at all not be lonely? What is the definition of loneliness? The definition of loneliness is being alone. We, we want to euphemistically call it oneness. People speak with great grandeur. You know what we need is oneness. Do you realize what you're talking for? We want to be one with the ultimate creator and become one, not together. Oneness. What does it mean? We want to be lonely again. <laughs> There's nothing else in it. How can you be one alone and not be lonely? It's not possible. Look at the very system in which the creation has taken place, that we are searching for the truth because we are unhappy. Unhappiness has been created by us by not living in the will of the God who created us, by not accepting him as the only reality. We are trying to get out of this misery of our own decision making by finding the truth which is God, the single consciousness. And we want to live in the will of the single consciousness Therefore, we are driving ourselves hard through church, through temple, through meditation, through workshops, towards loneliness. If this is true, that oneness is equal to loneliness, and our reality is oneness, should it not imply that inwardly we should all be lonely? If our own truth, truth of our consciousness, truth of that which makes us aware, truth of that which makes us alive, truth of that which makes us look at this world and walk about and live it, if the truth of that is one single creator with no other, doesn't it mean that we all are inwardly in reality lonely? 
If somebody were to ask me, is this room more real or loneliness? It's a loneliness. If somebody were to say, is this whole world which has been created, is that more real or loneliness? I'll say loneliness. Because by definition, I've accepted that the one single creator is the only thing that exists. The rest is all illusion, a creation. If loneliness is such an important part of our lives, we should all be lonely. So I did a little test. I met some friends who looked very comfortable and happy with their friends, some with their spouses, some with their children, some with their parents, some with their associates in business. And they looked, they were not lonely at all. They had a lot of company. They were enjoying themselves. So I decided to spend a couple of days with each of them. On the second day, they looked more lonely. On the third day, they cried out that they were so lonely. They explained to me, nobody understands us. Not even those people who are closest to us understand anything about us. Our relationship is only skin deep. Our relationship is physical. Our relationship is sensory. Our relationship is not even good enough in our thoughts. What about our spirit? We are lonely. Spiritually, we are lonely. Nobody seems to go deep into our own spirit. What do we want? People turn into poets, artists, writers, singers, musicians. They become speakers. They become authors. They, they go and commit suicide. They run away from things. They run into things. What for? <laughs> loneliness. Nothing else but loneliness. And yet, they want to show all the time we have a lot of company. We love it. The truth is, examine your own life. That even when you sit in a big crowd, you are alone and lonely. Spiritually, you are lonely. Don't feel worried about it. Don't feel sad that you are lonely. Because you are partaking of the truth. You are partaking of the consciousness of the single one, one creator. Who is alone. Therefore, you have to be lonely if you are real. If the spirit of God is really in you, the Spirit of God must carry loneliness with it. I want to make this point clear. There would be no seeker in this world looking for truth if there was no loneliness. That what really drives us to seek the truth, to drive us to a religious truth, to find higher levels of consciousness, to find a deeper truth, to find love, the ultimate cause behind all this is the loneliness of the human spirit which is the same as the singleness of God, the singleness of the Creator. That is why we are seekers. Then what is the difference between God, the only one who has created everything, and ourselves? The difference is God is lonely because there is nothing else besides, besides the Creator, and we are lonely because nobody else is like us. We have become the many, and it hasn't solved our problem. The one has become the many and has not solved the problem. How do we solve this problem? What is What exists that can solve the problem of loneliness? Effectively, people try a system called togetherness, which means we want relationships and companionships. Then we won't be lonely. And it works for a while. Every relationship looks like a divine relationship. Oh, I love you. This is forever. <laughs> then you should go after three months and see what happens. <laughs> I'll tell you something very interesting. I have seen the strange, strange thing happen when two people love each other and are not married. It is so divine. And a day after the marriage, it's not so divine. <laughs> How can it change so suddenly? And three months after the marriage, it is so taken for granted relationship. And after that, they are looking for other avenues to overcome loneliness. So obvious, every time we see this, the reason is that this system of trying to get someone else to overcome our loneliness does not work. Because the loneliness is not occurring 
from that part of our self which is separate. The loneliness is coming to us from that part of us which has never been separated. Our bodies have been separated. Our physical bodies are separate. Loneliness is not coming from the separation of the physical body. The loneliness is coming from the separation, the isolation of the spirit, of the soul. The consciousness has been separated and isolated. Therefore, we are lonely. On the other hand, the bodies are separated, and we think if the bodies are put together, we overcome loneliness. It doesn't touch it. Secondly, the loneliness is permanent. The bodies are temporary. Our consciousness or soul is permanent. Therefore, our loneliness is permanent. The bodies are temporary. In order to overcome this loneliness, we must find something that is equally permanent. Let's look around in this world and find some permanent thing. That will give us a clue to what could take away our loneliness. We look at all the people. They are all temporary. I think of so many of my friends. They're gone. Their bodies are gone. Nobody knows what happened. They talked of so many plans. They were making plans into the next century. They are gone. The plans are gone with them. How could they solve my loneliness? I look at the institutions around me. So many have gone down. How could they solve my loneliness? I look at everything around me. Does it change or not change? If it changes, it cannot solve the problem of loneliness. Whatever changes can never solve the problem of loneliness. What does not change alone has the chance of solving the problem of loneliness. So we look around ourselves. Is there anything that does not change? We find even the galaxies change. Even the earth changes. The seasons change. The trees change. Nothing is permanent. Everything that we can see with our senses changes. Everything that we can feel with our thoughts changes. Our thoughts change all the time. Our mind is full of change. Our mind cannot be still even to hold for a minute without change. Everything is changing around us. The only thing that doesn't seem to change is change. It's constantly changing. In this sorry state of affairs of change, how do we solve the problem of our loneliness, which is spiritual and everlasting? What can we find which does not change? So we begin to look back on something that does not change. And it takes quite a while. It takes yogis and sadhu and rishis and maharishis and masters and perfect living masters and master adepts and mystic adepts and experts going into the question of consciousness going into the real nature of the soul all these people the special doctors of the self they come up together and they say the only thing that does not really change is the self the observer that is observing this change that there is a consciousness in us which seems to be sitting like a witness like a spec like a spectator that is watching all this change that there is something in us which seems to be observing the change and that observer never seems to change. Hence, we find a direction to overcome loneliness. The direction is to find the unchanging observer in oneself. Because everything that is being observed outside is changing. And maybe the observer inside is not changing. Who is the observer? Our own self. There's no outsider observing. We are observing. And our own self is observing. Therefore, these great wise people, they looked at the problem of loneliness. They looked at the problem of isolation and separation and said, the solution is not outside. You can try as hard as you like. Go anywhere in this world. You will not solve the problem. If you want to solve the problem, go back within your own self. Discover the true nature of your own self. There you may find a solution to your loneliness. People have a hard time to go into their own self. Because the mind is busy in going into everybody else. 
going into everything else. If you sometimes in a in a meditation session or a workshop workshop session like tomorrow, any one of you will be coming tomorrow here. Good. Those of you who will come tomorrow, we'll have a special short session to make you watch your own thoughts, to make you watch how your mind works. It's a great exercise. You haven't done it because you think that what the mind is thinking, you are thinking. You have not never felt that the mind is something that works as an entity inside your head, and you can watch it working. You can see the mind does not think of it of the self at all. The mind thinks of everything else. That person, that person, that place, there, everything is outside of yourself. The mind is preoccupied in drawing your attention outside of this head into things that are outside, constantly, without a break. So you'll find that we are constantly in a state of discovering everything other than ourselves. When these old mystics said, know thyself, discover yourself. Self-realization is a real realization. Self-realization leads to true happiness. What were they talking about? What self? There's no outside self you have to search for. The self was within your own self. That is why the word self has been used. S-E-L-F -S in English. Self means that which is within yourself. And the mind that's constantly running is constantly taking you outside of yourself. You'll see it by demonstration. Therefore, we have a very hard time going within ourselves. Even when somebody tells us, oh, there's no problem. You know, if you have a loneliness, find yourself. Loneliness will disappear. Maybe the statement is true. But we don't know how to find the self. The biggest difficulty in finding the self is that we misidentify our conscious self with the covers upon the self. This human body, we take it as our self. We can take this human body to be our self if we were born in consciousness with the body and the consciousness disappears when the body dies. Some people believe it does. They should look for the self within this body. There are others who believe that the self does not die, it's the soul is immortal. Even when the body dies, the self, the, the conscious self sustains itself in some other form and remains in immortality. For those people, they must look to the self in the immortal state which survives the death of this body. There are still some others who believe that this self is really another body which can walk away from this body and that walks in heaven, that can climb an invisible bus that takes you to heaven. I saw a movie, by the way. There's some, some kind of uh, Disneyland type of traffic takes us to heaven and that this body, even when it dies, the other body comes out and walks into heaven. For those people who believe that, they should look for the self in that body. What I mean is, there is no chance for anyone to go outside of this body or any other body or the spirit to look for the self. How can a person saying, I am looking for the self, be saying, I am running to that university, I am running to that workshop, I am running to the temple, I am running to that church, I am running to that particular pilgrimage. Isn't that a waste? Don't we realize whatever definition you have of the self, it's all confined within this body. Even if you think the body is the only reality, it's still within this body. If the self, conscious self, is within this body, where would it be? The body. We know the dimensions of the body. We know our head to toe. We know our limbs. We know when we stretch our arms, how far we can go. The body is very limited. It's not difficult to explore the body. It's not like a big galaxy. It's a very small body. Should we start from the hands, the toes? Should we go on from the legs? Should we go to the torso? We can try from any end of the body. You start looking at the body and go all over the body and find out where are you looking from? After all, we have defined the self to be the observer of everything that can be observed outside. 
where is that point from which we are observing? From any angle that you start, you'll come back. Wow, we are somewhere in the head. You can try. You never feel that you are exploring this whole universe and exploring this whole creation from your hand. Even from your heart. You are exploring it in the wakeful state. When we are awake in this physical body, we are exploring it from some point in the head. And we open our eyes and look out. And we know we are somewhere in sight, watching out. That this body is a good tower of observation. And we are sitting inside, behind the eyes, and watching out. How many people know how to go behind the eyes? Hardly any. People go to meditation sessions. They go to meditation schools to learn how to go behind the eyes. There they are taught is in, the, in very nice faint music which creates the right ambience and the right atmosphere. You close your eyes. Sit in relaxation. When you close your eyes, what happens? You see nothing. When you open your eyes, you see the world. When you close your eyes, you see nothing. It's darkness. So you believe in opening eyes to see rather than closing the eyes. Why should a person close one's eyes to see the self when one can see better by opening the eyes, the physical eyes? Therefore, people who try to close their eyes to see reality ultimately try to peep out by opening their eyes. They must be outside something. If we close our eyes, we see darkness. How can we find the self within this body, within this astral body, the ethereal body, within this mind, within this soul, within consciousness, within ourselves? How can we find it when the very first step leads to darkness? That is where we all fail. Then the chanting can draw us, music, chanting, various external sounds which draw our attention outside. So, ah, now we feel relaxed. You feel relaxed because you go to sleep. It doesn't take you inside. People have claimed that this is the temple of the living God. That's a great claim to make. Whoever made the claim must have patented it because it's such a great claim. This body, this physical human body is the temple of the living God. All other gods are dead. There's no God living anywhere else. I challenge you to find any God living anywhere else except in this human body. This is the only temple in which you can find a living God. A God that can speak, watch, say, I'm there. All others are dead. If this body is a real temple, we have to go in, somehow or the other. Yet we don't know how to go in. We do everything to go out. How can we close our eyes and not see darkness? A hint has been given how to do that. When was the hint given? It was given about 10,000 years ago in a, in a text called the Rig Veda, the Vedas, in Sanskrit. It was repeated again a few thousand years later in Greek literature. It was repeated again in Egyptian literature. It was repeated in Buddhist literature. It was repeated in Christian literature. And has been repeated ever since the printing press came into being. And that hint was, I'll tell you in this latest English version, but you'll find in every language the same hint about how to close your eyes and not see the darkness. That hint has been very clearly given. For those of you who have read the Bible, you'd notice the words that I'm going to speak. If thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be filled with light. Here's the hint. If you close two eyes, you'll see darkness. But if your eye is single, your body will be full of light. It's a very clear hint what we should do. Why are we seeing with these two eyes? Because we think we are the body. If we realize that behind the two eyes, there's a third eye, a single eye, sitting inside. If we see with that eye, we'll see more light than we've ever seen outside. If you don't believe it, try it out. Test out these things. 
these, this statement has been tested over and over again and found correct. That the reason why we see darkness when we close our eyes is because we are seeing with two eyes, the physical eyes. And the way to see light inside by closing these eyes is to see with the single eye, the third eye, the eye of consciousness, the eye of the seat of consciousness, the eye of seat of awareness, from where all senses are arising, from where all thoughts are arising, from where our very being is arising, from where we can say, I am, I exist, from that point. If you see from that point, you're full of light. So the whole process, the spiritual journey to enlightenment, enlightenment means seeing the light. The spiritual journey to enlightenment is a very short one. Maybe it's from here, a couple of inches behind into the head. Physically speaking, it's such a short journey. People take thousands of miles of journeys, thousands of miles that travel for pilgrimage, and they won't travel two inches behind their eyes into their own head. Well, we can travel by United Airlines or American Airlines outside. How do we travel here? What is the mode of transport which can really take us the couple of inches back that we need? What vehicle can we use in order to travel back from these two physical eyes into the eye behind that can reveal to us that we are the observer? We are the single observer and therefore one with the same creator. And therefore this oneness can meet there, that we who have been externalized into the physical body can have a companionship with the eternal that never changes, and therefore can solve the problem of loneliness forever. Do you see how simple it is? We are all lonely because we don't fo follow this simple practice of finding our own self as our companion. Sometimes people uh, confuse themselves. How can self find self and say companion? Therefore, they've invented a very nice word, high-sounding word. It's called our higher self. How can you have higher and lower self? There's only one self. But if we are not aware of ourselves, we call ourselves lower self. When we become aware of who we are, we call it higher self. The point is, here is a strange situation that when we are separated, by the creation of the many, and we are lonely, and loneliness is a cause of our free will, and loneliness is a cause of our guilt and suffering and misery, and loneliness and free will are creating karma for us, we have a way out. Only a couple of inches journey, behind the forehead, behind these eyes, we go back, find our truth, light up everything, and we get a companion forever, and remove loneliness. Nowhere outside to search for. If this little journey can take care of so much, what vehicle shall we use? Now, unless you are an expert in travel, you cannot really design that journey. But those who are experts, those who have achieved the state we call self-realization, those who have discovered themselves, discovered the true self, they have told us that there is a certain vehicle available to each one of us, without exception, which can be used to travel the little distance. And that is called the use of human attention. Looks simple. Attention. What is attention? Say, put your attention on this. We tell children, where are you scattered in your mind? Put your attention on your work, on your book. Put your attention on this place. Look at this picture. Put your attention on that picture. Look at that corner. Put your whole attention on that corner. What does it mean? It means that the awareness which we have, the consciousness which we have, can be directed. Can be directed to any place we like through this process called the use of the probe of attention. As if attention moves where we want it to move. If this is true, and we use it every day, if this is true, that attention can be moved where we like to place that attention, then attention could be placed at the point where we presume is the real self or observer and thereby move backwards to that point. It's a beautiful system. There are so many spiritual journeys I've seen 
never anything like this that you can use such a simple device like human attention to go where you like and you can go right inside your head with that attention closing the eyes is not enough singing songs is not enough listening to music is not enough listening to external sounds and music is distracting what needs to be done is to put your attention at that point where your real self exists and that attention will find discover your own self if there is any other meditation in the world that is different from this bring it to me i have been round the world 70 80 times never found anything different we are given in different packages it's a salesmanship of the various gurus and the various swamis and the yogis they package their material in different forms to present to you, present to you. there's nothing else except movement of attention within different areas of the human body all experiences which have been related to spirituality are nothing more than the use of human attention at different parts of the human body therefore if you want to be enlightened while you are awake take your attention to the point of the self where you are while you are awake when you go to sleep at night your attention drops your focus goes down when you are at the throat you understand when you are at the throat ever heard this the feeling that you can be at the throat some people don't believe that they are at the throat i tell them every night you go to the throat how can that happen well you can't dream unless your attention operates from the throat okay you can test it out tonight when you go to sleep when you are before you sleep when you are alert awake in the body physically awake you put your hands on your eyes and you know where your eyes are even if you close your eyes you know exactly where your eyes are so you raise your hands even with your eyes closed you touch the eyes because you know where they are when you are drowsy little sleepy keep your eyes closed and put your hands on your eyes you touch your nose you will not try to touch the nose you will try to touch the eyes but you will be touching the nose and you will wonder how this happened you will feel as if your eyes have dropped here nothing has happened this is not this yogi practicing some pranayam this is an ordinary person going to sleep every night when we go to sleep the feeling where we are looking out from drops and drops from the real physical eye level it drops to the nose level drops further by the time it gone to the throat you are dreaming if you have the capacity through certain yogic procedures to be aware of the physical body while you are having a dream and somebody interested in that i can tell them how to do it that while dreaming you know that your body is there and you want to touch your eyes you touch your throat if you are in deep sleep and forgetful dreams you are in the heart you realize this attention the focal point from where it seems to operate itself shifts depending upon our physical level of consciousness that if we are awake physically awake we are behind the eyes if we are drowsy we are falling down and the further down we go the more deep sleep and relaxation we get into ultimately we, we go into such a deep trance that we go into the heart and people are going into the state hoping to find the true self how can you find the true self by going into deep sleep the only way to find the true self is by being more awake not by going to sleep anybody who teaches a method by which you go to sleep and find the truth is wrong we are already in too much sleep we have to wake up we need to wake up further it's only from this wakeful state that we stay awake and awake further into a higher level of earth consciousness that we can find who we really are therefore when in the wakeful state you close your eyes and put your attention behind the eyes you will notice it's a very extraordinary experience it's totally unlike any experience we have had in our life why because we are used to putting attention outward on things 
we are used to putting attention on something outside of ourselves all the time. When we look at things, we put our attention out. When we listen to music or listen to a person, we put our attention out. When we read a book, we put our attention out. When we do anything in the world, we put our attention out. When we think of something, the thoughts are of things that are outside. Therefore, we put our attention out. We never put our attention in. We are not used to it. In fact, there is such a big difference between the focusing of attention on a thing and withdrawing attention from the thing to the self. There is such a big difference in the two procedures that if you are trying to practice this on yourself, you are likely to make a very big mistake. You are trying to put your attention on something, whereas the process does not require putting attention on something. This two-inch withdrawal of attention is a totally different process than putting attention on something. Withdrawing your attention is different from focusing attention on something. Most of the time, even in spiritual traditions, even in meditational classes that are going on, we are being taught how to focus attention on something. How does that help? We are still going away from ourselves. The only way to come back to ourselves is to withdraw the attention that is already going out back to the source from where it's going out. Some people say, where is this third eye you speak of? Is it just a vague idea that uh, you get into your head or is it something real? I sometimes feel amused because I know that this third eye is the only reality we have. The rest is all illusion built around it. Yet we are questioning the reality and accepting the illusion as real. When we want to withdraw to the third eye center behind our eyes, we are really looking forward to going back to the very spot from where the attention is going out. If supposing some water is flowing from a spout, the tap is there, water, and I said throw the water back to where the spout is, it's not difficult to find out because we know the source from where the water is coming. If we want to take the water back to the source, we know exactly similarly Attention is flowing out from the third eye center behind these eyes. It's constantly flowing out from there. So there will be no mistake. We know exactly where to go back. It's not a vague point at all. It is the very point from where our attention is flowing out. All right, if that is too complex, too geometrical or too mathematical for people to understand where the third eye is, I give you a simpler way. Close your eyes and say, where are you operating from as a single point of consciousness? Where are you operating from? Explore your head. Wherever you move in the head, wherever you're exploring from, where are you are turning from, inside, that's where the third eye center is. It's not something that has to be vaguely determined. It's the only reality. You pull your attention back to that reality, the whole dream that we call physical existence seems to break up and light comes and tells us that we are really something else, more than what we think we are. Here's such a simple solution. The truth is so simple, our mind won't accept it. It's too simple for the mind. That is just a simple question of withdrawing attention. And that's all that is meant by finding the living God in this temple. Is it all that means by going back into our own real self? Yes, it is. It is simple, but very difficult. Why is it difficult? Because there is a, there is a machine, a little machine that we have skillfully prepared and nurtured and developed and uh, made more efficient. A machine we have installed in our head that works against our withdrawing the attention. And that machine, computerized machine, is called the human mind. <laughs> Looks funny that the human mind to which we credit all these great thoughts that come to us, the human mind to which we give credit for all the speech we have, all the discussions we can have, that very thing is the machine that stops us from going with it. Try it out. Again, tomorrow we'll do this. Try to think of anything else, it's very easy. Try to think of a point behind the eyes 
your mind will drive crazy and try to think of other things. True meditation, which is withdrawal of attention to your own self, to the third eye center, is difficult not because the journey is difficult, but because we have a huge monstrous machine working to stop us from going there. Ordinarily, our mind is constantly thinking. It's so crazy. It thinks when it doesn't need to think. For example, at night it should sleep along with us. Keeps on thinking. You wake up at any time in the night, the mind is thinking. This thinking machine, which is useful in its own way, when we want to use the thinking machine, we should use it. It's a good machine for thinking out various thoughts, thinking out how to live in the will of God, very good machine. Thinking out what to do next, very good machine. But when you use that machine to withdraw your attention to the third eye center, it's a great obstacle. Does not let us go in. It constantly, it makes you think of things which you have totally forgotten. Somebody asked me, I lost my keys, how do I find them? So do meditation. The keys will come in front. The mind will make you think of forgotten things like nobody's business if you do meditation. This mind wants to distract you. Why should it be so? Isn't mind the creator? Isn't mind the creator of all thoughts, of our seeking and good feelings? Why should this mind be so inimical to us? Why should the mind be our enemy, should be our friend? Why should the mind be an enemy of our spiritual progress? The answer is that spiritual progress or discovering your truth means the death of the mind. The mind is doing this for its own survival. If you discover your true self as a spiritual self, the spirit alone, the mind dies. The mind has no place. It's a machine. It's not a living force. The mind is drawing its life blood, its life strength only from the soul, your own spiritual consciousness or awareness. Therefore, the mind fights for survival. Supposing you want to do some kind of pranayam yoga, control of the breath, breathing, you breathe in, you say your some meditation with the breathe and focus on the heart. The mind cooperates with you. Supposing you want to go into deep, meditation in the lower centers of energy, the mind cooperates with you. Supposing you want to meditate on a picture of some hero, of some spiritual hero, of some deity, of some pattern which you think is spiritually significant, the mind will cooperate with you. Try to do any of these things which are external, which are below the eyes, the mind will cooperate with you. Try to hold the mind at the eye level, it fights. Try it tomorrow. I have tried with several friends several times. The mind is never so restless as when we try to pull our attention back from the physical eyes back to the third eye at the center of the head. As we try to pull the attention back to our own self. And yet, truth has revealed itself to us by this experience that when you pull your attention to your own self, you find that part of yourself, which while we are in this state of illusion, becomes a companion that takes away all loneliness. But what happens that we just try hard, try hard, and we can't get it? Then what happens? Is there no way to see that point somewhere outside visible? Can we see the third eye center? Can we see our real self anywhere other than inside the head? For those people who find it very hard to pull their attention inside, there's another solution, a wonderful solution. And that is called the mirror image of the third eye center that comes outside. This very center, which is the reality, which is our own self, it can be seen outside of ourself. That's amazing that this is possible, that the very thing that's inside should be seen outside, and yet we experience as if it is inside. Now that's where the trouble starts. When this possibility came into being, that you could also have that experience outside, people began to have a lot of problems. 
because the experience outside could only come when you could duplicate, make a copy of your higher self inside and see it outside. How can you make a copy of your own higher self outside? I don't know how we make a copy. We make copies of external things. How do we copy, make a nice, great copy of our own higher self, our own truth, of our own self? Make a copy and bring it outside and say, I know, because when I see that copy, something happens to me there. The copy is outside and something is happening to me there. That is where we find the role of perfect living masters. Have you heard this phrase PLM for short? I learned a lot of abbreviating since I came to the country. <laughs> PLM, perfect living master. What is a perfect living master? A perfect living master is an ordinary person like us. He should be as ordinary as we are. Otherwise, the copy is not perfect. As ordinary as us, and the consciousness of that person should be a replica of our own self. That person, outside as a copy, should be able to reflect what is our own higher self. That person, in coming in contact with us, should not say, go to the copy, but the copy should say, go to the original. That person, as a copy, should speak a language that only our own higher self can speak. Is it possible? It has been found it is possible. Not only possible, that from time to time, throughout history, such persons have come, human beings have come. And we call them masters, and we call them perfect living masters. They come once in a while. And when they come in our life, and they come in front of us, their, their role is not to drag us away to something outside. Their role is to present a picture of our own higher self, and thereby lead us in a gentle but real way to our own higher self inside. People ask me, where is the real master? Tell me truthfully. And I say, truthfully, the real perfect master is always inside you, never outside. You want to find a perfect master, always inside. If you can't find, then find a perfect living master, which is an exact copy of the perfect master inside. What is the substance of, of this? What substance makes up this perfect living master outside or the perfect master inside? What is the substance? Must be the same consciousness. The same stream of consciousness which creates all life for us has been given different, way, different words. That consciousness which creates the self in the first place, the consciousness that creates the creator in the first place, the consciousness that makes God and makes God itself, makes God the creator, the creative power that makes God. How can I explain all this? I can explain by quoting John, who says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was with God. All things were made by Him, and the Word was God. Nothing was made that was not made by Him. You must have read the first few verses, say John's Gospel. I am not talking for Christians. I will talk for others. The Vedas say, in the beginning was the great sound, and the sound created everything. Every tradition says there is something indescribable, a power that has been called Word, Logos, Shabad, Subud, Different words have been used to express that power which became the creative power and is our true self. That that self is the one that is our true master inside. It is that self that guides us and pulls us to our own reality. If we can't see it, then the same self comes in the form of another illusionary human being like we are and gives us guidance from outside only to the point till we can find the real master within ourselves. This person outside, if the person is identical with our inner self, is really personified, is the word personified. 
is actually the same logos in a form that is like us, our human form. That's the perfect living master. The perfect living master's role is to put us, put us in touch with our own logos, the word inside. Why has it been called logos and word? Why not call it power? Why not call it energy? There are so many English words available. Why couldn't God be called energy? Nobody has called God energy, except except some people who practice lower uh, <laughs> lower kinds of yoga in the six centers. They talk of energy all the time, but they never talk of God. They talk of energy levels, levels of energy, and so on. Energy is something so subterranean. It's below the spiritual earth in which we live. Power, power is built into ego, the separation. If you don't have ego, you don't have power. You separate. And ego is coming in the way of our unification, of our discovering our own one single self. We can't call it power or energy. What do you call it? Only two words have ever occurred to me to fit it. One is love which seems to identify the lover with the beloved, which seems to make the lover and beloved one. That's a good word for the creator. And the other word is for want of any other word, word. Word. Why word? Because that is that particular power, energy, and all these wrong words that we use for it is audible. You can only say word if it is audible, can be heard. Only that is word which can be heard. If it can be heard, here is another way. How to move these two inches back. If that power, that inner self of ours, has a vibration, a resonance, a music of its own, and we can listen to it and hear it, then hearing it must take us directly to where it is. So another way of finding our own self is to discover the resonance that comes from it, the music that comes from our own self, which we call word, the creative power, and listen to it and go back. In other words, this whole setup of a great land of illusions, a great land of delusions, a great land of guilt, punishment and reward, into which we have been trapped in misery, there's an escape from it. The escape lies behind the eyes. The escape lies discovering the truth of our own self. Self-realization is the escape. The escape lies in a companionship with our own truth, with our own reality, and not companionship that we look outside. And if we cannot find, if it is too difficult to go in, find one who is a copy, a replica, which we call a perfect living master. A perfect living master gives us the framework to see our own self outside and thereby love our own self, starting from there back to us. Love is the key. A perfect living master facilitates that from heaven. Now, this is a simple setup in which we are living here. The problems can be all solved by discovery of a perfect living master who then leads us to our true master within and we discover our own self that removes the loneliness and gives us self-realization. This feeling of love and grace that comes from this relationship is the key. While you have this kind of a relationship with a person, a human being whose only role is to put you in touch with the only single reality, this experience itself gives you an experience of love as nothing else has ever given. What did this man give me? Here's his picture. A great guy. We call him great master. What did he give me? I try to remember what did he give me. He, he only gave me love. Nothing else. Everything else was support for that. The truth was he gave me love. That was enough. It gave me everything. When you get love, this is, he didn't give me love of the kind I get from this world. In this world, when they give me love, 
They say, now we've given you love, what are you going to give us? What have you done for me lately? They want to ask so many questions here. They put conditions. This man gave me love without condition. Every perfect living master is distinguished because the love he gives is unconditional. There's absolutely no condition that you do this. That master loves you if you love that master. That master loves you if you don't love that master. That master loves you if you hate that master. That lo master loves you if you kill and crucify that master. That's the difference. That experience itself, apart from all the other technical details I gave you today, which some of you may not have liked, it is too technical. The fact that we can meet a human being who can give unconditional love alters our life in a way nothing else can. Our mind works, pumps up thoughts. How can this be real? Let me test it again. This may just be a game. This may be devil working. All kinds of thoughts the mind will pump into even prevents this from happening. But as time goes on and the unconditional love never stops from flowing, we ultimately get drenched in it and find that the object of that love was not to just have a good time. The object of the love was to find our own reality which takes away the pain of existence and takes away the misery of being here forever. I wanted to share this because in my view, that is true love. And that is the only way we learn to live in the will of the Lord. If we get that experience, it will not be hard at all for any one of us to live in the will of the Lord. Because then we will discover that the will of the Lord is nothing more than the will of our higher self. That the higher self always lives in the will of the Lord. That there are not two wills operating. There is only one. The will of the higher self. We make a joke of ourselves by trying to say, no, we'll go away, deviate from it. We never deviate. We just make ourselves miserable in trying to deviate from the will of the Lord. So living in the will of the Lord implies, first of all, you must love the Lord. To love the Lord means you must love your own higher self. To love your own higher self, if you haven't been able to find it, is made easy by loving a copy of your higher self in the form of the perfect living master. Tomorrow in the workshop, We'll go through some personal practical exercises. So we have an idea. What are we talking about? Where does all this happening take place? Is it all in this area? What does it entail? How do we go there? How does love develop in us? Have we ever seen that part of ourselves? Or have we overcrowded our doubts into the region of our love and spoiled, messed up even our love of God? We'll find that out tomorrow. Thank you very much for your patient listening. So long as you feel I can go and murder somebody, you are accountable. A person who says I can go and murder somebody is accountable because you are accepting free will by saying I can do it. Free will only disappears when this thought can never come that I can do it. God alone does it. You will not murder anybody. The whole situation changes when you live in the will of the Lord. And when you say, I can do this, when I comes up, you're automatically separating the ego and saying it's exercising its free will. Then you will say, if free will is an illusion, well, so is the murder. And so is the electric chair that you get. <laughs> so is the judge. So is the judge. So is the trial. The whole thing is happening at one level. When a show takes place, when you see a movie, and in a movie a murder takes place, we don't rush to stop the murder. We know it's a movie. It's an illusion. We just watch in our seats, having paid $7 each to see a murder on the, on the screen. <laughs> we know it's illusion, therefore we do not interfere. But the whole sequence on the, sta on the stage or on the screen goes on at one level of illusion. Similarly, in the physical plane, when we are living our life, with the feeling, I can do it, I accept free will, I don't accept free will, free will may be real, may not be real. When we think like this, we have adopted a pattern of illusion in which the ego has become real. And therefore, all consequences are also part of the same illusion. But we go through the experience of pain and pleasure even in the illusion. I, I might have reminded you earlier that it is not necessary 
to have a reality to experience pain or pleasure. Illusion can create pain or pleasure as real as reality. For example, if you're having a dream, in a dream, somebody hits you and you experience the pain, you wake up. The dream shows that person did not exist, the hitting never took place, but the pain was real. Therefore, pain does not require reality to create it. Therefore, in the illusion at which we are at this time, the whole sequence takes place as one serial of illusions. It's not singly that you can pick up one murder and say, I can tell the judge it's illusion. The judge can say, why are you telling me I am also illusion? <laughs> so we have to accept the package as a whole. The universe is so, it, it's so beautiful set up. Even the physical universe is so beautifully set up, provided you go through this universe like taking a Disney ride. But if you go through this universe, who oh, am I doing right or wrong? Where am I going to find that person? It's miserable. It's a very little twist, a twist of understanding, a twist of realization that makes all the difference between unhappiness and happiness. Of course, there is a lot of happiness that one gets here. I forgot to tell you that if you really go into the third eye and discover yourself, what will happen here? Have you then gone away from the rest of the world to find happiness inside? Or does the rest of the world still exist? It still exists with one difference. The very people who used to look at you with anger and hatred, after doing this, you go and meet the same person, they all seem to love you. One little change, you love yourself, your own real self, and the whole world loves you. You'll find a very big change. This whole creation changes when you find the truth about your own self. Good and evil are a division created of various actions so that we can accept the reality of free will. If good and evil were not there, we would not take free will so seriously. You become a person who knows, a person who watches the whole show as a drama that has been set up. Not only that, you also know how the drama was set up. You know exactly why the show was set up. Right now we don't know. We don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. Then you see the whole show. And when you see the big picture, then this difficulty goes away. Right now we see only a slice of life and makes a problem. With enlightenment you see the whole picture and takes away this problem. If you follow the teachings of Christ, when somebody says, Jesus Christ is my master, I congratulate him. But I meet thousands of followers of Jesus Christ who do not follow his teachings at all. What does he say? Go within yourself and find how many of Christians are going within. Go to a church and find people praying there. How many are going within? How many are running to a man-made church and not going to the church made by God, which is our own body? If you are a true follower of Jesus Christ, you will be going in the true church, which is the human body. Because a million of the Christ, he never said he is alone. Never. No way has he said he is alone is Christ. But Christ is the only way and the millions of Christs. There will be. God is not so unjust as to say that for a few people who believed, he alone will come, all of the seekers are condemned forever. There is no such concept of God existing anywhere. If God is good, all believers in God must have a chance. And God has given everyone a chance if he's a seeker. So to say that we have only a small select group of people and they alone can be saved and everybody else is condemned does not speak well of God at all. Would you worship such a God who creates his own children and then he says, just because you are not believing this, you are condemned? Is this your definition of God? Jesus doesn't speak of that God at all. Therefore, let us not misinterpret let me tell you the danger of not following a living Christ, but following a dead Christ. The danger is we make interpretation with our own mind and think this is the words of Jesus. Do you know the Bible that you read here has been amended, modified by human beings to 14th edition before it came to this country? Are these words of God? Go back into this. Try to study what is the teaching of Jesus. Go to the original Bible of Hebrew. You will be surprised to see the differences between what you are reading today and the Bible. Don't go by these words and these reputations created by other people. Go into the truth yourself. 
You want to talk to Jesus Christ? Go within yourself. He's right there inside you. Jesus Christ of Nazareth is right inside you. Don't talk from outside that I heard from somebody. If you go and see Jesus Christ inside, come to me, I'll embrace you. I'll say, yes, he's an enlightened man who has come and speaking the truth. But to hear say, this hear say, here and there and then to say, oh, we know about Jesus Christ. How do you know about him? I can believe. I appreciate your faith. I appreciate that you have faith in something. It's great. Faith, is, faith can move mountains. But to say, Jesus Christ is my master, go and meet him first. He's sitting inside you to be met. Walk with him. Talk with him. Come back to me. I'll congratulate you. This is a this is a religion. What's the difference between spirituality and religion? These masters came here, gave us spirituality. They gave us the way. They gave us the way out from this misery. They gave us the way to self-realization. We have lost the way. You only talk about what they said. We talk about what words they have used. Do we go inside? Do we follow them? How can we say we are true Christians if we do not follow anything that was said and just want to repeat what other people are repeating as words? If we are true Christians, we would follow what Christ taught. And if you follow what Christ taught, you will find that Jesus Christ has lived again and again. Supposing he came and walked in this room today, what would you do? You would crucify him again. The way you have made up your mind, you will crucify him again. Go and check it out. My friend, go and check out these things. It's all inside you. There's nothing outside. There's no knowledge. There's no truth outside of ourselves. All the knowledge, all the truth that you want to find, all verification you want to find, is all inside you. If you go inside and come to me, I'll become your disciple. If you hear from here and there and say, I believe this, okay, you have a right to believe. So have I right to believe. We all have our own right to believe. And fortunately, we live in a country where everybody is given the right to believe. There are some countries in this world, people are not even given the right to believe. You are lucky to be here. Everybody is lucky here that you have the freedom to explore the truth in your way. Believe you can. Faith you can have. But to come forth and talk about a person, talk about a master whom you have not met, you not fair to that master. Meet him. Come forth. I'll hold you up like this. I say, here's my hero. You have not done that. No, I'm not judging. I'm only saying, I'm only saying that you're expressing your belief system. Because from my experience, if your experience is different, you have a right to it. My experience shows that this man, whose photograph you see here, did not say believe in Jesus Christ. He said go and meet Jesus Christ. And he made people meet Jesus Christ. That's all I'm saying. Your congr congratulations if you have done it. Yes. Some research has been done of the missing 17 years of his life and so on and what happened after crucifixion. And that particular book tries to draw uh, inferences from historical data they have collected. All I know is that in India, northern part of India and Kashmir, there's a grave. And that's called the grave of Jesus Christ. And the people who are managing that grave in Kashmir, India, they claim this is the same Jesus Christ of Nazareth who came here, and they and that he died there. So uh, it's a matter of interpretation again. I mean, nobody really knows. There's some research done by an American scholar who went there and wrote a book. It's for you to go and investigate. But you can go to Kashmir and investigate. My suggestion is investigate within yourself. Find out within yourself. God has, uh, has shown himself in many ways. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to share one thought with you today before we close. That uh, I have found that it is very, it's very difficult to say where is God. And we believe in through religious tradition mostly, through our own religious upbringing and religious tradition, how we have been brought up. We locate God in certain places and religious tradition tells us where God is. So we belong to different religions. We relocate God in different places. But one thing I found, that if somebody intensely seeks God within his or her own heart, has 
from my experience. If somebody in with great intensity, not outside, but within his own heart or her own heart, seeks God, things happen in the life of that person to reveal what that person should do next to meet God. Therefore, the secret still continues to be seeking within yourself. Seek and you will find. The seeking, so long as we think we have free will, so long as we think we are in this physical world as individuals, what we can really do to find something is to seek intensely and seek with all our might but within our own selves. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow.